different series that we've been investigating on living life in the kingdom as a child of God. Kingdom living, if you will. This morning we come to Matthew chapter 5, and verse 13 through 18. And there's a second text to the sermon, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. I wonder if you would uh, do some Methodist aerobics and stand back up with me as we read from the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, Jesus says to the folks that are gathered around on the hillside, as he teaches his disciples how to live in the kingdom, he says, You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? And you make it salty again, it will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Don't misunderstand why I've come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. And then Paul's letter to the Galatian church, chapter 5, just one verse, verse 13. Paul says to the brethren at the churches in Galatia, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, Use your freedom to serve one another in love. The word of God is for us to be with God. Thanks be to God. We've been spending time these past number of weeks with uh, one or two interruptions um, with Jesus on the mountain, the Mount of Olives, where he preached. Uh, what is arguably the most famous sermon in the world. The Sermon of Our Lord on the Mount, 2,384 words. I did some math the other day. I, my sermons average about somewhere between 15 and 1,800 words. Therefore, uh, Jesus preached longer than I did. But the point is that I've had to spend seven sermons to say even what he said in the Beatitudes. So, He says a whole lot more than I ever say with a lot fewer words. Uh, But then again, I think he knew that. Uh, 2,384 words introduced by the Beatitudes and ends with the astonishment of all the listeners marveling over how Jesus taught with such awesome authority. Uh, This Sermon on the Mount was heaven's proposal for how we should live if we want to take seriously this notion of loving God. Now, there are virtually libraries of books written on the Beatitudes alone, let alone the other 109 verses of Jesus' sermon. But in choosing to preach seven sermons on this sermon, I am obviously not exhausting everything that could be said about living as a follower of Jesus Christ. simply chosen the seven topics that have been, in my opinion, the most important for me in growing as a disciple of Jesus Christ during the last nearly 60 years. As we live the Christian life and we grow into our discipleship, we become like a garment. If you can picture a garment that is woven together, Jesus wore a garment that was seamless, and I think that's the kind of garment that, uh, that the church is designed to be. A seamless garment woven together with holy thread. The threads of what weaves us together as a church and as the cosmic church of Christ, all the strands provide and receive strength from each other. Think about that for just a second. I think if you've ever done any weaving of any kind, or maybe braiding of hair, if you start off with a strong strand and you marry it to another strong strand, strong strand is hard to say three times in a row, but 
as you weave these things together, there's a multiplication that happens exponentially. And by that I simply mean, I, I'm not a calculus major here, but uh, if you take one holy strand and you weave it together with another holy strand and another one comes on top of that and another one on top of that, pretty soon you don't have two strands or four strands. Whatever number of strands are woven together, you can multiply it by whatever, whatever astronomical number you care to because that's what God does in us. You remember what the scripture says about wherever two or three gather together in my name, there I am in the midst of. As we are woven together as holy strands in the church that Jesus is building, we become much stronger than we are apart. <clears throat> it's not a saying that uh, is absent in our uh, culture today. That saying we are stronger together is something that uh, has come about because of all the divisiveness in our country. And it is a big saying these days. But it's no bigger. It doesn't even begin to approach what Jesus does in his church worldwide and in a small body like ours. We are like a garment woven together with holy thread with strands providing strength and receiving strength from each other. Paul said it this way, Christ is all and he is in all. So as we look at the Beatitudes, as we look at the Sermon on the Mount starting off, each of these exhortations where Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who hunger and thirst at Christ. When he says each of these exhortations to live a godly life, it is a component of and a bridge to what Jesus wants to do. Each of these is vitally important. None is greater than the other. Each provides a pathway to the others. When I am woven together in a thread with one of you, you are woven together in a thread with somebody else, and we are woven together as Christ does this. We become strength for each other, but a pathway to each other. I want to open that up. Um, the first number of topics that we have covered in this series, the first one was about faith, believing in Christ and having a faith relationship with Christ. Then we talked about having a relationship with Christ in prayer. We also talked about forgiving and being forgiven by others. We, a couple of weeks ago, talked about giving, developing our Christian, our life in Christ through stewardship. And today's topic or theme is serving as a slave. Serving as a slave. If you want to be a holy thread in Christ's church, the idea of slavery has to come in. Within the Bible's 1,200 chapters, there's more than 1,450 times when the word servant or serve is used. And something that's mentioned that often needs to have our attention. So what I want us to do for these few minutes that we have is to look at developing our lives of service, uh, of, of discipleship through serving as a slave. And yeah, I know what you're thinking, slavery was outlawed. Yeah, that's true. There's, uh, there are laws in the books against slavery in the sense that you cannot make somebody else a slave to somebody else or demand somebody be your slave. But we're not talking about that kind of slavery. We're talking about discipleship. We're talking about becoming God's servant. It's something for which we volunteer. It's not a conscript. We are volunteers in the army of the Lord, you know might say. We choose to be slaves of Christ or we choose against it. I want to give you three words of discipleship and relationship this morning. These three words are words that are in the ancient language of the New Testament used to describe different ways of having a relationship with Jesus Christ so that you can be a servant. These ancient Greek words range from the weakest to the strongest. It's kind of like a uh, progression, if you will, where you uh, you picture a house and it has a front steps to it. In the old days we called it a stoop. 
uh, you know, with three steps here, and we're going to use these three words as the three steps going up to the house of relationship with Jesus Christ. I know John Wesley did this very well in terms of describing the house of salvation. And right now, I want to talk about the house of relationship with Jesus, being in the same house with our Lord. The three words going from weakest to strongest from a Christian perspective are these. It's Latroyo, Diagonos, and Dulos. Three Greek words, ancient Koine Greek, forming a progression of relationship with Jesus. We're going to start on the lowest step, the weakest step, if you will. Latroyo. Uh, the weakest relationship is that of legalities, where you are related to him because of a contract. The word Latroyo is translated minister in many cases throughout the scripture, and it speaks about the one who is hired to perform a service. <coughs> You know, one of the things about being a pastor is that I am warned as a pastor not to be a hireling, not to be somebody who preaches just to get paid. But that's what the word minister, in a sense of latroyo, the weakest relationship to Christ, means. It means somebody who is there for the money. Many people see their relationship to God as something of beauty where they have to pay back an obligation. Uh, a legal responsibility to worship God. Oh, I come to church because, well, that's what I do. I was trained to do that by my parents, and, you know, it's my duty, it's my obligation to go to church on Sunday to worship Him. Folks, that is weak in thinking, and it is weak in theology as well. If God wanted people to pay Him back, He surely would look elsewhere than the likes of us. I mean, how can you repay the cross? How can you repay anything about the cross? Jesus dying in our place. You can't repay that, can you? There's no way. Paul said it very plainly in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 that we ought not to boast about all the good stuff we do because we can't do anything. We are not saved by our works, by our goodness. We are saved by grace, His grace, His kindness. And so, Latroyo is the weakest of the steps that we are talking about in terms of getting close to Jesus, in terms of a relationship with Jesus. To be related in a legal sense is to say, yeah, I was baptized, yeah, I joined the church, yeah, I serve on this board, I serve on that, I do this, I do that. What is that? It's I, I, I. It's an I problem. It's my opiate. The second word that we're investigating this morning is the Uh This is a little bit stronger than Latroyo. Uh, this is the next step on the ladder, if you will. The Diaconos is a friendly host to Jesus. This is somebody, we get our word deacon from this word, and it, uh, we have deacons in the United Methodist Church. Uh, Baptist churches have deacons on, uh, in, in their polity. Uh, these are people who are supposed to help. Deacons are supposed to help the pastor. Uh, deacons are supposed to have service ministries where they do things for people. Well, it describes the one who follows after Jesus to be really a heartfelt lover of the Lord, but a doer for the Lord. Today, there are a lot of people in our society who love the idea of doing something for Jesus. Did you know that in the current generation that's coming along, most times people don't tithe as a matter of fact that, well, we understand that tithing is a biblical principle and that's what God requires of us and that is the starting point of our Christian stewardship. You know, most of the generation in, the, in this millennia uh, have a different viewpoint than that. They will give if there is a need presented to them that they see as worthy. For instance, that person over there is going to die unless they get a heart transplant. So, oh, we're going to give to that cause. Go fund me. Someone who starts has cancer. They need money. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you that. But just to put the money in the plate as a free will offering and say, I, you know, I let go of it, Lord. You do with it. You bless it. You're much better at managing it than I am. You see, there's a difference between Christian stewardship and giving to causes. 
Today, there are a lot of people in our society who love the idea of doing something for Jesus. And frankly, people like this go to church, they give, they serve on committees, they serve on boards, and it's a nice picture of nice people doing nice things in a nice way. And as long as everything stays nice, everything will be nice. It'll be okay. <clears throat> However, you and I know that this is not a nice world. Now, the goodness of a lot of people that you know aside, this is a world that is divided. This is a world that is violent. This is a world that is dangerous sometimes to live in. We live in a world that's touched and gripped and ripped by sin. Not everything in the church, not everything at home, not everything on your job, not everything in the public space will be nice or ideal. So we have two words so far. We have Latroyo, the minister who is hired to do a job. We have uh, that second word, whatever that was, Yakimos. And uh, the third word is Dulos. Dulos. Uh, and this literally is translated slave, but even stronger than that, it is the strongest of relationships that the Bible can talk about. This is the strongest word for relationship to Jesus. Dulos. It literally means bond slave. Someone who has bound himself to another. In the days of the Bible, I almost hate that saying because the Bible was written over more than a couple of thousand years. Uh, so in the days of the Bible, it would be a wide span. But go back to the day of Jesus. Go back to when Jesus' uh, uh, disciples and the apostles wrote the scripture as God gave them the word. Uh, the word bond slave took on a different meaning than just a slave, just somebody who was owned because he was purchased. A bond slave is somebody who voluntarily gives himself to someone else with no choices over his life. And it was done with a ceremony. When a person decided to become a bond slave to another, to be bound to that person, to serve that person, that person would, in a ceremony, back up to a post, and his ear would be stretched across the post, and a nail would be driven through the ear into the post. And he would stay there for a short period of time, so that the entire community could see the blood that formed that relationship. You know where I'm going here, don't you, when we have a cross right in front of us. This relationship was offered to us by another pinning to a post, the cross of Jesus Christ. And when we become bond slaves of Jesus, it is a whole different thing than Latroia or Diakonos. This is Dulos, this is bond slave. The person who is a bond slave has no choices over his life. Uh, that kind of a person is committed for life to serve the master of the house, whatever wishes that master has. It requires a kind of commitment to give yourself to someone. Another of the pictures that Paul uses and Jesus used was the marriage picture. When Elizabeth and I stood before Reverend Barsley, a Methodist minister, back before the days of, uh, of the United Methodist Church, this was the Smithtown Methodist Church, uh, Reverend Barsley asked me, Russell, do you give yourself to this woman? You know, and that's the idea. The bond is to be so great as a to be a lifetime bond to death, to us part. Paul, the apostle, James, Peter, John, many of the other disciples refer to themselves as the bond slaves, the doulos of Jesus Christ. This is the strongest word of relationship. You start off with the guy who gets paid to show up. That's Latroyo. You move to the friendly <coughs> post of Jesus. <coughs> In the diaconos, a little bit stronger, but not the strongest link of relationship to Jesus. Somebody who does things, doesn't get paid for it, but is kind to other people and, and does things for the Lord in his name. Why? Because, well, it's just nice. It's just what I want to do. But then you have a new boss. 
The Latroyo is a hired servant on the first level, so he's there for what he received in payment. And frankly, when the payment stops, so does he. The Diakonos is serving because of favored conditions and everything remaining nice. The Dulos, the bond servant, if you step onto that step, you're on the same level as where Jesus is walking because that's what he wants. That's where he wants to meet you. Because of the cross and God's mercy and grace, the new loss is there to lose himself in a lifelong, loving disposal to the master's wishes. You see the progression? It goes from receiving wages, which is the weakest relationship, to giving of self, which is the strongest of relationship. Now the essence of our text in Galatians can be explained in light of those three words. When you think about those three steps on the platform leading into the house, a relationship with Jesus, think about what Paul said when he said what we ought to be to each other. He said, serve one another in love. When he said serve, which word do you think that he used? Did he use Latroyo? Serve one another as long as they pay, as long as they, you know, give you something in kind. Or did he say, be a deacon, do good things, because you'll feel good about it. That's your reward. You don't need to get paid. That's your reward. You'll feel good about it. Be a good person. Or do you think he said, do loss one another? Be committed to one another. Be so linked to each other that others can see the blood flowing between you. I think he used the word doulos. As a matter of fact, that's what's written in your New Testament. The relationship is based on giving ourselves to one another, servanthood, slavehood. He did not use Latroyo saying that we have an obligation to serve like a hired waiter. He didn't say diogenos, indicating hanging out with the brethren until things got rough. He said doulos. We are to be slaves devoted to each other, even as we claim to be devoted to Christ. I have a deep thought here for consideration, and it's not my thought. It came from Mark chapter 10, verse 44, where Jesus said, whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. Do loss, he said, of all. That means I'm to be Jean's do loss. I'm to be Anna's do loss. I'm to be Paul's do loss. And you are to be Russell's. We are to be each other's bond slave. Bond slave to the ministry of Christ. Here's a deep thought. A rephrasing of Jesus' words in Mark 10 44. Those who consider themselves slaves to everyone in the body are considered greatest in the body by the head of the body. You want to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus where he actually speaks to your heart. And you feel his embrace in your own heart. Stepping up from the Troy, the Optimus, the Dulos, step into the house. That's where Jesus lives. It's the same thing with winning souls or visiting the sick, serving the body. Being Christ's servant means that you do the work because you are his. When in compassion you meet the needs of people instead of just judging them, you are truly serving. You remember the parable of the Good Samaritan, the true servant of God's, was the man who put aside some things. He put aside racial division. He was a Samaritan. The guy in the ditch was a Jew. Can you imagine the Arabs and the Jews getting along, helping each other like that? He put aside economic considerations because he had to pay for this guy going into the hospital. He put aside religious considerations and barriers because uh, the Jews and the Arabs, frankly, worshiped differently. He did all of that to meet somebody's dire need. Jesus asked the listeners who were listening to this parable that we call the Good Samaritan, and he says, which of the three who walked by do you think was actually a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And one of them said, the one who showed mercy. 
Jesus finished off the statement by saying, Well, you go and do the same thing. Get on it. That's what you lost is. We listen to what Jesus said, says, and we do likewise. Let me bring this home to where we are here in this community, where you live, where I live. There are thousands of people in the community who need the ministry of this body. And yes, I'm talking about Pleasant Hill. I'm also talking about Mount Zion. I'm also talking about all of the United Methodist Churches. I'm talking about the Baptist Churches. I'm talking about the Episcopal and the Catholic Churches. I'm talking about every church. And I'm talking about people who have given their fidelity to Christ, but for some reason they're not part of the church. I'm talking about the cosmic church of Christ. Everybody who names the name of Jesus Christ. There are thousands of people in every community of every stripe be it city or country or suburban, who need the ministry of the body of Christ, of which you are part. You know how I can say that very easily today? It's because you came here on such a rainy day. <laughs> you came here despite COVID and despite the difficulties and the, uh, the fact that it's a dreary day. You're here. It means something to you to be here with the rest of the body. You're committed to it. Those who have consecrated themselves to serve the body and to get with the body to serve the community are really serving the master. Matthew 25 tells us what the end times will be like when God finally judges everybody of all time. Church member, non-church member, White, black, red, yellow, male, female. And God judges everybody. One of the things that the king will say is, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. I want to close with a, a beautiful story that was written by Leo Tolstoy, a wonderful Christian author. Fantastic thinker. And he wrote a story about a humble shoemaker by the name of Martin Cobbler, if you will. In a dream, Martin has one night. Jesus speaks to him and he says to him, Martin, I'm going to come to you shortly. When Martin woke up in the morning, he was really excited. Jesus was going to come and visit him that day. He knew it. And so he swept out his shop clean and got everything orderly. He prepared a delicious meal and had it all out there and waited for the master to show up. Sometime during the morning, a hungry, exhausted child came by the shop. So Martin fed her and allowed her to lay down for a little while, and then she got up and left. About noon time, uh, an old woman happened by. She was cold and she was shivering. Martin gave her a shawl and she put it on and wrapped herself up and walked away. Late in the afternoon, a beggar was at the door, he had no shoes on, so Martin, a cobbler, he knew what to do, he gave him a pair of shoes. Strangest thing was that Jesus just didn't come in the dream. When Martin went to bed that night, he was disappointed. That night, Jesus once again appeared to him in a dream, and Martin asked the Lord, he said, Lord, why didn't you come visit me? I waited all day long. And Jesus smiled at him, and Jesus said, Martin, I came to you first as a young child, and then I came to you as a shivering woman, and then I came to you as a barefooted beggar. When we help a needy person, when we offer food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, we're actually helping Jesus, you know that. When we care for the forgotten of our society, as Jesus did, we're actually helping Jesus. So, what do you think, Paul? Serve one another? Do loss one another? We can take that to heart in very ways. We can serve one another like Salome served John the Baptist. That's the world's way. Remember what Salome did? She served John the Baptist dead on a platter. That's the world's way, isn't it? We can betrayal one another like hired servants just doing what we do because it's our duty to do things around the church and be grateful. We can diakonos one another 
like fair weather friends, being nice among the nice, as long as everything is nice. Well, we can be biblical slaves, we can be doulos, committed to each other, filled with mercy, meeting needs, and doing it with love unto the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, help us to let go of this world's ways and sing the song of life service the way you showed us. Towel, basin, and cross. For the glory, honor, and praise to which you alone are worthy, O Lord, we pray in the name of the Son, cooperating with the Spirit to honor and exalt the majesty of the Father. Let it be so in each of our lives, we pray. And now let the doulos bond slaves among us shout, Amen. In number 344, Lord, you have come to the lake shore. We'll sing the first two verses of that hymn. If you absolutely must sing it in Spanish, go ahead and do it. The words are there. I'm going to sing in English because I don't speak Spanish. Lord, you've come to the lake shore. And guess what, Lord? I'm ready. I'm ready. I've left my boat behind me. I'm ready to follow you. That's the commitment of someone willing to back up to the post and become a new boss. I decide I will seek Jesus. You know what? Isn't that what a new boss does? It's a hard thing to not burn bridges and make that jump into the boat with Jesus. That's what a new boss is. That's what a servant really is. Go in the name of Christ. Go in his peace. Go in his grace. Go in the leading of the Holy Spirit. But go. I mean, really, go. May the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Have a great weekend. <laughs>